Amen. What a thing to count on. And no matter what you're going through, no matter how dark the day can seem sometimes, God is faithful every step of the way. Every moment of every day, God is faithful to you. Are you all excited to hear from God's Word this morning? I'm excited to share. We have, we have a good passage today. It's not going to seem good when we first read it, but we have a lot of interesting and I hope very practical and helpful things to learn. So would you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We are having some tech fun today. We are having some tech fun. 1 Kings chapter 19. Turn there in your copy of God's Word, and we're going to read just the first four verses, four verses that are completely out of character for the man of God that we've gotten to know lately, Elijah. These are words that you're going to think, how in the world did the guy we looked at two weeks ago go through this? So follow along with me. Start with me in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. So let's call time out right there. What did Elijah do? Well, he went toe-to-toe with the prophets of Baal. And then after God sent fire down from heaven, he slaughtered 450 prophets of Baal at the brook Kishon. You can see that from chapter 16, verse 40. So Ahab runs back to Jezebel and tells Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. This is out of character for Elijah. So let's pray. Let's ask God to teach us, based on this passage, what is happening here. Father, we come before you, and we are so thankful for your word. We're thankful that it shows us not just the mountaintop moments in Elijah's life, but also his deepest valleys, his hardest days. And so, God, would we learn today from Elijah's hard difficulty? Would we learn today about how we can navigate these seasons in our own lives, Lord? So teach us, minister to us, Lord. We, we pray this so often, but we, we know it's true every single Sunday. We don't gather here to hear my thoughts and my opinions, Lord. We gather here to hear from you. So would you teach us, Father, by your grace and by your spirit. Fill me with your spirit as we look at your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, so verse number one. Now, now these four verses, it's, it's really not a difficult story to, to track with, right? So basically, here's, here's the story in a nutshell. The story is this. Elijah has slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal at the brook Kishon after God sent fire down from heaven. And so Jezebel finds out about it, and she sends Elijah a death threat. You've got 24 hours, Elijah, and you're a dead man. And so she sends this death threat, the queen, the most powerful person in the land, and Elijah gets terrified. He runs for his life down to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And in Beersheba, he leaves his servant behind and goes even another day's journey into the wilderness by himself. And that's where he sits down and says, Lord, just take my life. This is too hard for me. This is too much. He's in a spiritual thunk. How many of you have ever been in a spiritual funk? How many of you are in a spiritual funk right now? Anybody willing to say it? It's not uncommon for me to get in a spiritual funk. In fact, you see this in in, in Bible characters all throughout the Bible. Just read a couple of the Psalms and you can see David gets in these these funks, doesn't he? I mean, he's got his, his mountaintop moments, but he gets depressed, doesn't he? David can get really down into the pit. You see this with Paul. Even Jesus, I think at times, battled this spiritual kind of depression that takes root at times. 
This happens over and over again, and it's possible it happens at times in your life. Moments where you, you wake up and you're not really quite sure why, but you just don't care. You ever been there? Right? You wake up and it's a work day and you just think, Lord, I don't want to do this today. I don't want to get in the car, drive to work, and be a good employee. I don't even want to walk to my refrigerator and make a sandwich, right? Lord, I don't want to do it. Or maybe you're in a spiritual funk and you come to church and everybody's singing and you're looking around thinking, why are we all here today? Why do, we, why do we even do this? One moment you can be on the mountaintop and God is so real to you, and the very next moment you can be thinking to yourself, God, I don't even really know that you're real right now. That's how cold I feel. That's how distant you feel from me, Lord. I'm in a funk, and that's where Elijah is. And so what he's going to do is he's going to run over 100 miles. When Jezebel gives him this death threat, Beersheba in Judah is not a close city. It's a hundred miles away in a different land. And so he runs a hundred miles south and he hides from this woman. And here's the question. This same man, just two weeks ago, we saw him stare down 450 prophets of Baal and he didn't bat an eye. He's gone into the palace of the king and said, King, there's not going to be dew or rain on the earth these years as long as, as, long as I've got a say in it as, as the Lord God lives. This man has had courage and boldness every step of the way, and now one death threat suddenly sends him into a spiral, and he gets scared, and he runs for his life. What happened? What happened to his backbone? What happened to his courage? What happened to this man of God who was always willing to stand alone? Now he's running scared. What's going on here? Well, here's a couple of realities you can write down if you're taking notes this morning. The first one is this. We are vulnerable to spiritual depression right after a spiritual victory. Let me say that again for you so you can write it down. We are vulnerable to a spiritual depression right after a spiritual victory. This happens in Elijah's life. A couple of weeks ago, we saw him on the mountaintop, right? He, he's, fire just fell from heaven and ate up a sacrifice that he dumped water on over and over and over again. And in his life, this was only about a day ago. All right, for us, it was two weeks ago we saw this. Elijah went through this like that day or, or the day before. This is still recent. He just saw God show up. And you would think he would say, oh, Jezebel, get real. You can't touch me. My God is on my side. You would think he'd have so much courage and faith, but this time he is scared and he runs for his life. Why? Because when we have these mountaintop moments of victory in life, often what happens is a different temptation, a different struggle comes out of nowhere and sideswipes us when we're not paying attention for it. Elijah just had a mountaintop moment, but he wasn't looking out for this. And so it caught him. It snuck up on him. Here's the next one you can write down if you're taking notes. We're vulnerable to spiritual depression when our body, soul, and spirit are running on empty. When your body, soul, and spirit are running on empty, it's not a good combo. It's not a good combo at all. Eric, I don't know if you could throw this up on the screen or not, but I've got a verse here, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. In fact, take, a, take your Bibles and go there with me. 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Okay, so you guys have it, I don't, but at least you guys can see. So I've got it up on the screen for you here. Verse 23, this is a prayer that I pray for you all almost every day as your pastor. Here's, here's a prayer that I pray. This is, I think it echoes the heart of God for each one of you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Or in other words, may God sanctify every part of you. And what is that? May your spirit and soul and body. May your spirit and your soul and your body. So you see them right here. There's, there's three parts. 
Each one of you are made up of three components, if you will, body, soul, and spirit. Here's how we can kind of break this down. So this bottom section down here, the body, that one's pretty self-explanatory, right? Each one of us is a physical person. We have a body. We can feel and taste and smell and touch different things. Each one of us is a physical body, and our bodies are something we are to care for. There's something we're to steward because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the, in Corinthians, Paul says, you've been bought with a price, so glorify God in your bodies. Your bodies cannot run on empty forever or else you'll fall into the pit of depression. The next one here is your soul. Now, your soul is really your mind and your emotions. It's what you think and what you feel. So when you feel things like shame or guilt or excitement or when you, when you think to yourself, anybody else like to talk to themselves a lot? Yeah, I talk to me all the time. Some people think I'm crazy, right? So, so that's your soul. That's the part of you that feels, that, that, that's more than just physical. And your spirit, this third one here, this is how you relate to God. How you commune with God is through the Spirit. This is why in John chapter 4, Jesus says, God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So when you pray, that's your spirit communing with God. When you worship, that's your spirit communing with God. Your spirit is what tells you that God is real and that He's there and that He's faithful. You can even see this in creation, okay? So on days 3 and 4... God makes things that are physical. They have body only. So you've got the plants on day three, the sun, moon, and stars. Each of those things are physical. But do plants feel things? Do stars have emotions? No, no. These are physical only. But when you get to day five, God creates animals. Now, are animals body only? No, animals actually have a soul. Did you know that? That's why when my dog got in trouble with me last night and I scolded him, he felt shame. He felt remorse. And then later on, he jumped up on the couch and cuddled with me and he tried to make up with me, right? Because he's like, do you still love me? Yes, buddy, I still love you, even though I don't like you, right? Right? Because he knows that my dog understands that there's right and there's wrong. He understands what it means when he's in trouble. He has emotions. He can think. He can feel. Now, does my, does my dog have a spirit? Can he accept Christ as Lord and Savior? Does he know how to pray? No. Sometimes I get mad enough he should learn how to pray, but that's, that's not the point, right? He's got a soul, but he doesn't have a spirit. By the way, let me call time out here. This is one of the reasons, one of the arguments why a lot of people believe our pets will be with us in heaven, okay? So, so plants, these, these are just body. Your animals our body and soul. So a lot of people believe, and the Bible doesn't come out and just say it, right? So we have to kind of piece some things together, but a lot of people believe that our pets will be with us in heaven because they have a soul. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I'll let you guys figure that out. I'm not saying that your pet goldfish that you got at the carnival when you were seven years old is going to be there with you, right? So if you beat me there and he's not there, I'm sorry. But I think there's an argument here that you could say your pets will be with us in heaven. There's, there's, a, there's a, a biblical argument you could make from this. But when you get to day six, this is the climax because God makes us in his image, or in other words, we're body, soul, and spirit. We're physical. We have a soul. We think and we feel, and we have a spirit. We commune with God. Now, what does all of this have to do with Elijah? Here's the first thing you can write down about Elijah's situation. <clears throat> the first thing you can write down is Elijah's physically exhausted. He's physically exhausted. His body is worn out. His body is tired. So we just said a, a little bit ago that he slaughtered 450 prophets of Baal at the brook. And I don't want to be gruesome or gory, friends, but if you've got a sword and you've got to slaughter 450 people... That's a lot of hacking, okay? That's a lot of stabbing movement. My arm would get tired after about 10, okay? He slaughters 450. He's tired. Look with me at the very last verse of 1 Kings chapter 18. Verse 46 says this, 
Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. So Ahab's in his chariot, and he's driving his chariot 13 miles. That's a half marathon, 13 miles to Jezreel. And Elijah, in the strength of the Lord, runs faster than Ahab's chariot. I mean, I don't know what he was having there, but can we put that in a protein shake and sell it, right? Can I have that in a protein bar? Could you imagine that? Think about that from Ahab's perspective, right? You get up tomorrow morning, you're going to work. You still have your turkey Thanksgiving hangover, right? You're just kind of on autopilot driving down the road, and you look over, and there's a guy running alongside your car. Hey, hope you have a great Monday. And then he just blows past you, right? That's what happened to Ahab. He's run 13 miles at full speed, and now he's gone 100 miles down to Beersheba and even another day's journey into the wilderness. Our man is tired. When you're in a spiritual funk, most of the time you're physically tired. Have you noticed that? You need a nap. It's that simple. In fact, that's what he's going to do. Take a look at verse 5 with me. He lay down, and what's the next word? He slept under the juniper tree. He says, he says God, please take my life. I can't do this anymore. And then he gets a nap because our man is tired. Next one, Elijah's emotionally worn out. So he listened to his feelings. He's emotionally tired. He's emotionally drained here. He's had the roller coaster of emotions for the last three and a half years of God training him, and he's been on the mountaintop. He just saw his countrymen turn from Baal and start following God again. He's gotten to see God send fire. This has been quite a lot, and he's drained. Listen, can I tell you something? When you're spiritually depressed, you're typically drained emotionally. You've been feeling and feeling and feeling, and you're tired of feeling. You're drained. What about this one? He was spiritually drained. So he listened to his enemies. He would never have listened to Jezebel otherwise, but he's spiritually drained because he's poured out his heart to God in prayer over his country. He's seen God stir up a revival. He stood in the gap all by himself. He was having the weight of the country on his shoulders as he led this revival and this, this showdown on the mountain. Spiritually speaking, he is exhausted. Yes, he just won a spiritual victory, but there's been too much. He is drained. And so this man that wouldn't normally have listened to Jezebel listens to his enemies. He stops listening to God. He stops listening to the truth. Instead, he listens to his flesh, his feelings, and his enemy. And here's the last one for you. Elijah was alone. Notice this. Verse 3, he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Then he goes another day's journey into the wilderness. So now he's alone with his thoughts. And listen, sometimes it's good for us to be alone, right? Sometimes we need some alone time. In this case, it wasn't helpful for Elijah. Because now he doesn't have a friend to slap him upside the back of the head and say, Elijah, you're not thinking clearly. Didn't you just see God send fire? Didn't you just see God show up in a big way? You're, th you're, you're not looking at things clearly. Do you ever need somebody to say that to you? And that's the very moment when the enemy tempts you to isolate yourself. Do you see that? The very moment when you need somebody, a brother or a sister in Christ, to look at you and say, look, I love you, but you're not thinking clearly and you're throwing yourself a pity party, that's the very moment that you don't want anybody around you. The enemy does that on purpose because he wants to cut you off from the godly advice you would get from brothers and sisters, and he wants you alone with your own thoughts because that's when you start going into the worst case scenarios. And here's where Elijah goes. He says, God, this isn't worth it anymore. Would you just kill me? Would you take my life? He's suicidal. He gets that low. He says, God, I, I can't do this anymore. This is too much for me. His body's worn out. Emotionally, he is just drained. And spiritually, he's exhausted. And he's all alone. And he is in a deep pit. Have you ever been there? I've been there. Some of you have been there, and you know you're not thinking clearly, but you don't know how to get out of it. You know you're not looking at things right, but that's just the only thing that's real to you, and it doesn't feel like God's existing. It doesn't feel like God cares for you or that he's there. It doesn't feel like you're ever going to get to the other side of it. The only thing that's real to you is how bad you feel. And I want you to notice the temptation that the enemy gives him. 
when you are in a pit, the enemy will always tempt you to make a major life decision. End it, Elijah. End it. You don't make major life decisions when you're in a pit, folks. Some of you have wanted to quit your job because you're in a pit. Listen, maybe God wants you to quit your job, but let's do it when we're thinking more clearly, right? Maybe God wants you to move, sure, okay, but let's do that when we're thinking more clearly. Don't make major life decisions when you're in a pit because you're not thinking clearly. You don't see everything as it is. And Elijah's trying to make a major life decision and praise God that he prays this prayer. And what's God's answer? No. I'm not going to take your life, Elijah. You can throw your pity party. You can pray all day, but I'm not going to do this because you're not thinking clearly. I thank God for the prayers that I have prayed that he has said no to because I was in a pit. Amen? Praise God he doesn't give us everything we ask for when we're not thinking clearly. Now, next week, we're going to look at how God loves Elijah through this. We're going to see some beautiful things about God next week about how he tenderly and gently loves us. This week, can we get a little bit more practical? How do we help ourselves in this situation? How do we take care of our body and our soul and our spirit? How do we help other people who are in a funk? Some of you know somebody else who's in a funk, and they just need some help. How do you help them? You want to shake them, but that's probably not going to help, right? So what do we do? Well, here's a few realities for us. We have to understand that all three of these, your body, your soul, and your spirit, they are connected. They're all connected. So if you're not taking care of your body, don't miss this. If you're not taking care of your body, that will impact your soul and your spirit. It will. If you don't get enough sleep, you're always in a funk, okay? If you snack all day and you don't have a meal and all you eat is ice cream, that will impact your soul and your spirit because they're connected. If you don't make wise choices and you have a sin that you're harboring in your life, and you're not willing to repent of it, that will impact your body. And this is why some of you go to high school reunions or college reunions, and you see that person, and you can't recognize them because they look horrible. You know what I'm talking about? You think, wow, that person aged 25 years in the last 10. Why? Because sinful choices have an impact on our bodies. All of this is connected, brothers and sisters, and so we need to learn to take care of our body, our soul, and our spirit, because if we let them slip, if we're running on empty, we'll go into this funk. We'll go into this pit. So what do we do? This is going to be very simple. It's not rocket science, but simple doesn't mean stupid, right? Simple often works. So here's how you take care of your body. How many of you have heard these three before? Let's start with this. Let's get some proper rest. Some of you, listen, some of you don't need medicine, you need a nap. Can I say that? You need to go home this afternoon, shut off the TV, quit playing your hobbies or whatever it is, and just get some sleep. Some of you haven't slept eight hours in years, and you're running on empty, and your adrenaline doesn't work like that. Eventually, it gives out. And I know, listen, you guys that know me, I'm the pot calling the kettle black here. This is my weakness, right? I struggle with this too. God's designed our bodies to rest. That's why he gave us a Sabbath, one day off a week where you get rest because you can't go and go and go like the Energizer Bunny. Some of you need better food. You need to eat healthy meals. How many of you get hangry? Anyone? Come on, be honest. Oh, like three people? Everybody's lying in church this morning, right? Listen, it's like the Snickers commercials. You're not you when you're hungry. So grab a Snickers Make a cheeseburger, put some lasagna in the oven, whatever your thing is, and eat a real meal, okay? You cannot snack on peanut butter crackers and get through life. It doesn't work. My mom's favorite are ho-hos. Doesn't work, mom, right? You got to have real food. You need to fuel your body because your body can't run on sugar and junk. What about the third one here? Get some consistent exercise. Walk for 20 minutes a day. They say that will make your brain two times stronger. 20 minutes of walking a day. We can almost all do that. Or if you don't like just exercise for the sake of exercise, then 
can I encourage you, find a friend, toss a baseball. Go shoot a deer and drag it 150 yards out of the woods, right? Whatever you need to do, I don't care, but get some consistent exercise. How many of you know when you exercise, you go for a run, you feel better afterwards, right? Why? Because your body, your soul, and your spirit, they're all connected. When you take care of your body, it will take care of your soul and your spirit. We have to take care of our bodies, friends. We cannot run on empty. Some of you all work too much. Work is important. We need to have a good work ethic. Some of y'all work too much, and you need to slow down. This is some advice that my dad gave me when I was working with him at the church in Scotland before we all moved back to the States. He said this. He said, Ben, I ran so hard in my 20s and my 30s. He said, now I'm 50 years old, and I feel like I'm 65 because I went too hard, and it's catching up with me. I'm paying the price today for the recklessness I had before. We need to slow down. We need to rest. We need to eat well. We need to exercise. We need to take care of our bodies. How do we take care of our souls? Well, do something refreshing. I don't know what this is for you. For me, I have two things. I like to go to a lake, like Car Lake, with, like I did with my little girl. There's nothing like swimming in a lake. You got an eagle flying overhead. Can, you could just look around and see everywhere. The water's fresh and it's cool. That is the best thing in the world. I feel like a million bucks when I get to do that. Sometimes I go golfing, although if I play bad, then that's not refreshing, right? I want to break my clubs. What is it for you? Is it a hobby? Is it time in the woods? Is it a walk? What is it for you? Now, notice I don't have on this list, this, this is probably going to surprise some of you, I don't have social media, okay? Social media does not help your soul. Did we know that? Social media does not feed you. It drains you. The news doesn't feed you. It drains your soul. Movies and TV, be careful what you put in your mind. Be careful what you, what you, what you dwell on. Most of the time, when you're in a funk, you need to get some fresh air and go outside, not sit on your phone. I know this sounds very simple, but all of this is connected, friends. God's designed all of this this way for a reason. And so do something refreshing or confide in a friend. Notice Elijah didn't have a friend. He could have vented to his servant here and said, hey, am I crazy? And then the guy would have said, yes, you're crazy. Let me tell you why. And he would have needed to hear that. Some of you need somebody to tell you when you're acting crazy. Can I say that? I need that. That's why I married Kara. She's a counselor. I get my counseling for free, right? <laughs> it was genius because I need that. Some days I'm not thinking clearly, and some days you're not either, so confide in a friend or journal. Sometimes you don't know what you're thinking until you start writing it out because then you're forced to find the words to describe how you're actually feeling, what you're actually going through, and what you actually think about your life. Some of you need to start a journal just say, okay, this is what I'm going through, and this is how I feel about it. That's good for your soul. What about your spirit? Pray. Pray, pray, pray. And I'm not talking about your Sunday school Christian prayers, okay, where you try to find all those, the right words and you sound like super Christian. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about pray honestly and raw with God. Be reverent, but he's also your father. You can talk to him and tell him what's going on. For me, this is my walk from my back deck to the playground. Catherine and Eric have probably seen me do this a bunch of times, okay? If I'm frustrated, ticked off at life, I wait till the girls go to bed, and I walk out my back deck, and I walk towards the playground, and I am just hot. And I'm telling God about it. God, I don't like this. This thing frustrates me. I'm really ticked off about this thing. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost right now. God, I don't understand, right? These two have probably seen me kick dandelions out of frustration, I'm angry, but by the time I get to the playground, most of the time my perspective has shifted. It shifts, why? Because God's ministering to me in that moment. As I'm praying to him, he's reminding me, oh yeah, maybe I caused this problem. Or maybe things aren't as bad as they seem. Maybe God has a plan here, and maybe I don't like my circumstances, but I can trust God anyway in my circumstances. Listen to me. Some of you just need to spend some time alone with God and pray and tell him where you're at. Yes, it's good to talk to a friend or to journal, but sometimes 
We wait too long to go to God. And you can be honest with God, so where are you at? Tell him. Be reverent, yeah. But you can be honest and say, God, I'm frustrated. I'm ticked off. I don't like this. That's okay. He's a big God. He can handle it. What about worship music? I've got five songs. I'm that guy that plays my songs on repeat. Is anybody else like that? You, we're annoying, aren't we? We are so annoying. My wife just wants to tuck and roll out of my car when she's driving with me because I'm, I'm just, it's the same songs over and over again. Why? Because those songs get my spirit in the right frame of mind. They remind me of who God is. They remind me of how great he is. They set my mind on the truth instead of my feelings. Some of you are in a funk. You just need to go find a good worship song or a band that just reminds you of how great God is or reflect on God's character or in other words, write down what is true. I know it feels like God's not there, but he'll never leave you or forsake you. I know it feels like God's forgotten you. He won't forget you. Write down what is true. It feels like he's not going to give you direction, but he won't leave you lost. He'll always be there. Write down what is true, because here's what happens. Your feelings start to lead you instead of the truth. Now, feelings are good. God gave us feelings, friends. But feelings are supposed to be your companion, okay? You're supposed to take your feelings with you through life. They should not lead you through life. If you follow your feelings, if you follow the way you feel at any given moment, that will lead you astray because our feelings are fickle, right? We don't always feel correctly. So we always have to come back to the truth. Let the truth tell you how to feel instead of letting your feelings tell you what's true. Can I say that again? Let the truth tell you how to feel instead of letting your feelings tell you what's true. We have to come back to the word. We have to come back up to what's true about God's character. And listen, we have to take care of ourselves. Elijah's big mistake here is that he ran on empty for too long. And when the temptation came out of nowhere and sideswiped him, it snuck up on him, he wasn't ready to deal with it. It caught him off guard, and next thing you know, he's saying and praying things he never would have said or prayed. We've all been there. So if you want to avoid going back to that place again, can I encourage you? Care for your body, care for your soul, care for your spirit. They're all connected. If you're trying to help somebody, can I encourage you to give them some of this advice? Hey, when's the last time you sat down and had a real meal? Do you need a day off? Can I watch the kids so you can get a nap? What do you need so that you get out of this funk? It's okay to go into a funk. That happens sometimes. But how do you get out of it without doing something dangerous or reckless? Because we don't make big decisions when we're in a funk, right? We wait till we're thinking clearly. We wait till we see God and his truth the way that it really is. So, brothers and sisters, let's care for our body, soul, and spirit. Next week, we'll see how God cares for us when we're in the pit. We'll see how God loves us when we're spiritually depressed, and I think you'll see some beautiful truths about King Jesus next time. Will you pray with me as we close? Father, we're so thankful for your word. Thank you, Lord, for how practical and relevant it is for our lives. God, this is, this is stuff that is, is so simple, and yet you've designed it this way. You've designed our body, soul, and spirit that they're all connected and that we are to care for them. We're to steward them well. So, Lord, would you help us with that? We live in a world that moves at a breathtaking speed. And it's hard for us to slow down. It's hard for us to pause and care for our body, soul, and spirit. So, Lord, would you help us with this? Would you help us to prioritize Sabbath rest? God, you're not taking a day from us. You're giving us a day where we can commune with you and fellowship with people that we love. God, would you help us to, to eat well, to exercise, and to get proper rest? Would you help us, Lord, when we're in a funk to confide in a friend or journal or do something that refreshes us. And Lord, if our spirit is just out of whack, out of tune with you, would you help us to spend time in prayer or worship or just to reflect on who you are? Because God, as we do those things, you get us back on center. You pull us out of the pit that so often catches us off guard. God, thanks for how you have loved each one of us in our moments of being in a prayer. Thank you for how you've loved us by saying no to many of the prayers we have prayed when we didn't know what we were really praying for. And so God, would you minister to us in Jesus' name? Amen.